I'm Julie Bullitt. I've been a family therapist for over 30 years. I'm David Bullitt. I've been a divorce and family lawyer for more than 35 years. Together, we have been married for more than 37 years. In our professional practices, the two of us have been witnesses to individuals and families struggling with life's most difficult challenges. In this podcast, We will talk about the conversations we have had, the conversations we should have had, and those that every relationship needs to have in order to find success, happiness, and fulfillment. This is Conversations for Couples, the podcast. Welcome to po- to our podcast, Conversations for Couples. Today, we're talking about disagreements in a relationship, arguments in a relationship, fights in a relationship. Should we have them? How do we have them? And how do we get over them? And to help us navigate arguing, fighting, and disagreeing, <laughs> we've got Deborah Fox with us today, a, a licensed clinical social worker, a certified, if I pronounce this right, Deborah, imago therapist. Perfect. Excellent. A certified sex therapist, and uh, you have your own local practice here in the D.C. area. So welcome aboard, Deborah. We're so happy to hear have you here. Great. Um, my pleasure to be here. Excellent. So let's start off with, right off the bat, you know, should people fight? People in a relationship, should couples fight? Well, whether they should or not, they do. So, you know, we, <laughs> <laughs> that's just the way it, that's just the way it is. Couples argue. Absolutely. You know, there was an article in the Washington Post about a year or so ago about this couple that lived in Virginia that swore that in after 40 some years of marriage that they never once had a disagreement. We were asked about <laughs> that on the local Fox show and both Julie and I said, that just doesn't sound possible to me. <laughs> what do you think about that? I would say that maybe it's possible, but they are absolutely the exception. Okay. You know, like yeah. somebody who's lived that, 106, sort of thought, right? right? Yeah, yeah. And and also I, I was wondering about what their definition of, of a fight was. So maybe right. not like a, mm-hmm. you know, drag down fight, but you, you certainly have to have disagreements in relationships. So what do you see in your office as, you know, a therapist, a, a you know, marital counseling therapist? What do you see mm-hmm. most often that people have difficulties with around fighting and disagreements? Well, I think the biggest difficulty people have is that they just take over, you know, that fights escalate in a flash. So whatever they're arguing about, it just seems to take another course. And they say, you know, I don't even know what started it. And that is the million dollar question, because it's really true. People don't know what starts so many of their fights because it just is in it's, you know, just like a match gets lit. And suddenly somebody shuts down or and freezes and walks away or somebody just gets immediately angry. And then the fight is just off and running and it sort of has a life of its own and isn't even connected probably to what started it. But are there certain areas when, when we did our research, are there are certain areas that that folks tend to find regular and frequent conflicts over when, that you see? Um, to me, it's not so much the subject matter. I mean, mm-hmm. certainly money is a, a big one. Parenting styles is a big one. Extended families, you know, relating to them is a, in a, a big one. Sexuality certainly is a big one. But, you know, I don't think it's the subject matter as much as it is everybody's individual you know, what, what are their points of vulnerability? You know, what are their pain points? And those are the ones that get touched regardless of the subject matter. And that's where these fights just get out of control. So how do you help couples real, you know, learn each other's touch points, you know, raw vulnerabilities, the triggers, how do you help couples with identifying that and then doing something different with their partner? Right. The most important question. And, you know, it's not obvious. So it's so important to look at the very first seconds. I call it the first 30 seconds, but it, sometimes it's really the first three seconds is what is it, you know, that snapped in somebody and it happens so fast, they even lose track of it. So when couples are talking about an argument 
And, you know, unfortunately, once these escalations happen, that's where all the hurtful things are said. That's where the pain is. And that's what they want to talk about. And I'll say, you know, I know this really hurt. You said some mean things. But if we're really going to change this, we've got to back up and back up and back up. What was the very first moment that you can remember or even before the moment? And I've had, um, you know, couples nod their heads and they, they're starting, you can see their eyes, they're starting to track back and they realize, you know, I'm really mad at you about something else, even though we were fighting about, you know, how to cut the chicken for dinner or whatever. It, might be. Right. it becomes and, a cycle, uh, doesn't it? I mean, it becomes a cycle for folks, doesn't it? Of course, because those same, not those same triggers that are outside people's awareness they keep, it's like a tripwire, a minefield, you know, you keep tripping it over and over again. So people really have to get back to figuring out, oh, it really wasn't that thing we're arguing about. It's really that, you know, I felt like you just weren't listening to me. And that really, that's hard for me. My mm-hmm. mother never listened to me. My father <laughs> never listened. I never had a voice. Right. Right. So how do you, you know, how do you identify, how do you sort of give couples like fair playing, you know, fair fighting rules? What are some of the things that you, you know, work with couples with on that? Yeah, there's really one. And and the, the one is to have a timeout. You know, they can use, they can think of a fun word or a creative word or just use the timeout signal. But once they realize they're into a fight, there is nothing they're going to do that's going to come out of that that's going to be good because our nervous systems are really designed to protect us. And once we feel offended in some way, you know, we go into survival mode and it's as if we have a sign that's written across our forehead that says, I no longer care about you. I am busy surviving. Oh, wow. What a visual. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Gotta yeah. Make a hat that, uh, yeah. yeah. What a visual. So, yeah. so, so they just have to stop. They yeah. have to stop. Yeah. So one the of the moment. things, yeah. So, and that, and that's a great point. And one of the things to sur- sort of further that, you know, time out, you know, piece mm-hmm. and, and strategy, which I think is wonderful is I tell couples that I work with is take a minute, but not a week. So mm-hmm. let's talk about that. Yeah. So taking, so sort of stopping the process, which is an emotional one, but then also making sure you come back to Absolutely. whatever the issue was. Yeah. And it's really important to come back when you feel you have really like settled down and you've really reflected on the conversation. And what do you have to apologize for? Even if you think you only caused 2% of that problem, you know, what's your 2%? Because if you can come back and say, you know, I'm sorry that I spoke to you in that tone of voice, even if you felt justified, you know, we don't. And and then that totally changes sort of the atmosphere between two people. And hopefully your partner then can yeah. do the same. Then you, you're more likely to have a conversation. And that could be, you know, a minute is probably too short for most people. Mm-hmm. But as you say, a week is like way, you know, too long. So, you know, if it's 20 minutes for one person, it might be 24 for another. Right. Um, I mean, people are different. Right. right. People, I mean, so, so, so yeah. we, we talk about, you know, Julie's very easy um, about pivoting. You know, if we have a disagreement, she can pivot mm. pretty rapidly. I have, yeah. I sometimes it takes me a, takes me a little bit longer to sort of move off of that. I don't want to say a grudge, but that's sort of, yeah. you know, that, that, that sort of thing. So in terms totally. of, of strategies, other than the timing that you talk about, you've got a couple in your office, they're fighting regularly, regardless of what the topic is. You know, what, what kind of strategies can folks employ or do you work with folks to employ in order to help them get through those types of disagreements? Well, once they stop, once they learn to stop, which is a big one, yeah. that's a skill. <laughs> right. That's a skill. Absolutely. The next skill is what I was saying is about the apology. And then it's how do you talk about difficult things? And the biggest skill there is listening until one person, so one person has the floor until they are finished. Hmm. Yeah. And so now taking in my turns. office, yeah. yeah, in my office, 
you know, I sort of control that. It's not forever. Um, <laughs> but, you know, when they what they want to learn in my office, they want to take out into their real lives. Mm -hmm. And that listening skill is critical. And when the other person is finished, if they can tell them what they heard, you know, yeah. here's what I understand you said, because so often we're not listening fully and we misinterpret, we misunderstand. And that's where, you know, fights can bubble up again. Yeah. Yeah. So that's yeah, huge. That is big. So t talk to us about the mind body connection and the work that you do with couples. Um, I'm very intrigued about how you bring that into, you know, couples work. Yeah. So a lot of what goes on in us is what I say is beneath words. And our bodies hold a lot of information that we are not aware of. And we call that implicit memory. And implicit memory is simply what allows you to ride a bike after 20 years when maybe you haven't been on a bike. You don't have to think, how do I ride a bike? You know, you just get on the bike and ride it. Um, but when difficult things happen to us in life, we often sort of, they're uncomfortable. We put them out of our mind, but the implicit memory holds on to them if they have been significantly, you know, bad experiences. And so really exploring that almost in sensations, like if you get anxious or you get angry or you get sad, often you might have some physiological sensations. You might have a tightness in your chest or your throat or your face gets hot or your heart starts beating or you have a knot in your belly and those have those are actually the way the body talks right. so, so how do you yeah so how do you use those i mean you're helping people couples identify them in themselves but also for their partner yes yeah it's a it's a yeah so two for process so if if somebody says Oh my, I just have this knot in my belly when I talk about this. And mm. just I'll simply say, if that knot in your belly had a voice, what would it say right now? Mm. And I will tell you, different things come out. Because what's usually coming out from those uh, questions is not necessarily what's cognitively available to them. You know, what they, they don't know it in their brain at that moment. But if they tune into that knot in their belly, that knot has something to say. You know, that's interesting because uh, a couple of months ago, we had, Julie and I had some bump, a bumpy period, right? Everybody mm -hmm. does. And I sure. remember saying to her, you know, I'm walking around just, I mean, I just feel like, you know, I weigh a hundred pounds more than I usually do. And, uh -huh. and it yeah. was, and it was all of this whole you know, swirl, perfect storm of issues were, were just mm -hmm. weighing on me. And I did, I, I did feel that way physically, really, really yeah. did. I mean, I, you know, I'm out walking, I felt like I was walking slower. I felt like I was moving slower, I was banging into things all over, mm -hmm. <laughs> all over the place. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so what do you tell somebody, what, you know, how do they get over that sort of feeling to move to a better place? Well, it's the identification first is what is it you're feeling, you know, right. and sometimes if you really pay attention to that heaviness and just use lots of words, you know, what is that heaviness like? So, you know, I feel stuck, you know, I feel like I can't move or it might come to, I can't feel it. I don't feel like I can do anything right. You know, mm. um, I, I feel helpless. So if you just, if you tune into that physicality that you were describing that heaviness, you might find that you're going to come up with, you know, some feelings or some, just a way of phrasing something that really fits for you. And that might help you identify kind of what's going on beneath, you know, the, whatever the argument du jour or the issue that you're trying to sort out or whatever. And in, and in a, in a, in a couple's environment, you know, so now, so now you've got you know, we're sitting in your office. Let's take us for example. Okay, we're okay. sitting in your office. Yeah, we could we could have used you a few weeks ago. <laughs> I'm thinking the same thing, <laughs> but we got through it. But but we're sitting in your office. I've described this feeling. We've talked. You know how how I feel physically. We've talked about what was going on that may have may have been may have helped cause in some ways that feeling. What mm -hmm. you know? What is what's the other partner's role in that whole dynamic? Well, the other partner's role is you know, where, what are they experiencing? Yeah. Right. Because often they've got their own narrative going on. 
And so, yeah, so just to kind of take this further, so he feels this way. I'm a therapist. I want to fix it. (laughs) Ah, yes. Right. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Fix it. People have a, their own struggle, you know, (laughs) because often we can't fix things (laughs) either in ourselves or or, or, or the person or the person in our case that, that, that needed, that needed some fixing didn't want to feel like a client. Right. You know, so, you know, and so it was, it was an interesting, it's an interesting dynamic. So you've got this, you've got the two perspectives on the same circumstance. I mean, the same thing is happening, um, but two very different perspectives, right? Exactly. Because, you you know, you live on the planet of David, you live on the planet of Julie. (laughs) And sometimes those planets seem like they're in completely different solar systems. Sure. And, and so it really is sort of like crossing a bridge, you know, Mm -hmm. to a foreign country. Mm -hmm. Can you go there with wide eyed curiosity? What is it like over there? You know, how do they eat their food? What, how do they, you know, cross the street? What what are their norms? Mm -hmm. And, and it's that empathic connection is what we're really looking for, but we can't do that when we're angry or we're highly anxious, we're irritated or we're snappy. You know, we have to get to those deeper places of vulnerability in order to be able to make that connection and understand. I mean, sometimes, right, people don't don't come out of that that, that feeling of a, of agitation or, or anxiety for you know certainly not in a fifty minute session with you. It could take could take days, right? Right, or somebody might well, need their all, yeah their own ahead. therapy. Some I was thinking some people you may see couples that you're like, okay, you know, you need to go do your own work to kind of identify and figure this piece out before you come together as a couple to work on things. Yeah. And there's so many different ways to, to do this. There's not one right way. I mean, you mentioned, um, David, 50 minute sessions. I actually worked in work in 90 minute sessions Oh, okay. because Even better. When, you, when with a couple and, and when it's a regular, like what traditionally has been an individual session, it feels like you just sat down, you right. know, you just kind of got into something and then, you know, oops, it's time to leave. Um, so yes, it uh, it does take time to sort talk of go to, down what I call these bit. layers. Yeah, I can imagine it. It can take it can take several sessions. Obviously, whether it's oh sure, minutes. oh yeah. yes, yeah. yes. This yeah. is not a quick fix. Yeah. So so right. talk talk to us. Let's pivot a little bit between uh-huh. to the the differences. And you're and you're also a sex therapist. Correct. So so tell us a little bit about you know the you, you know the differences in terms of when you put that, or maybe there aren't any differences, you know, in terms of whether you have two different hats, whether those hats can be worn at the same time, what are the differences? What do you do in, in this sort of umbrella as a sex therapist that may be different than you do in a normal couples therapeutic environment? Well, unfortunately couples therapists and sex therapists are considered are different. And that's, some of us are trying to change that because all couples therapists should become sex therapists and all sex therapists should become couples therapists. There's just been this divide that, you know, is just ridiculous. And so um, I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but I'll try. No, that's so as, a sex, as a sex therapist, you really need to learn so much about couples dynamics, not just about sexuality and sexual function and sexual differences. You need to be a couples therapist because all the couple, the emotional relationship and the sexual relationship have many points at which they intertwine. On the other hand, couples therapists do typically do not know enough about sexual functioning. And I've had so many couples come to me and they just haven't gotten well served because of just a a knowledge base that was missing. Mm -hmm. Because there are some things about sexual relationships that are very specific that therapists absolutely need to know because the general public does not. So give us a couple examples. Sure. I'll give you a big one. <laughs> so there's actually two, two different, how much time do we have? But it's coming off when you're ready. Good, good, you I, can, I can sort of, this is like, you know, pulling the, one of those doll chains and just yeah, yeah. talking. Um, a huge one that the public really needs to know about. Um, and fortunately there's some books recently that have come out um, is about that. There are different styles of, of sexual response. And one is called spontaneous. And that's the one we know about. That's the one that we see in the movies where couples walk into a room, they tear their clothes off, they can't get enough of each other. And it's as if that goes on forever. Those are the folks that are walking down the street. And if they're 18 years old, 
about every third thought is a sexual one. Yeah. You know, if they're 35, maybe it goes down to every sixth thought. So that's the, that's well, I'm a, the one I'm we know about. I'm 63, and I don't think it's – I've gotten every sixth thought yet, so I'm, 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 not, I'm not in a rush to get there. He's but go, doing go, great. Go, go ahead. <laughs> and then there's this mass of humanity that nobody knows about, and it's called responsive sexual desire. And there you go. Julie knows about that one. Yeah. And it is more represented by women. Um spontaneous desire is more represented by uh, men, but not everybody. I mean, mm -hmm. I just say more. Um, and so for responsive folks, they, what's so important for them is the context. The context is not, it, it's central to, to their sexuality. It is determinative. And what that means is if a responsive person is, uh, preoccupied with a work deadline or a problem with a child or they're they're really or they're tired then their openness they certainly are not thinking about sex you know and if their partner you know approaches them it's sort of like what <laughs> you know they're it's like not where they are whereas with a spontaneous person and they have a little fever and their partner says, hey, you know, you want to have sex? I go, sure, why not? You know, right. that's right. very, very different. Mm -hmm. And so couples, people and couples need to know that this responsive style exists because it's probably their partner. These groups meet each other and they connect up with each other. Um, and so the responsive people tend to think there's something wrong with them. Right. And it's just such a shame. So this is a huge one. Yeah, I imagine that the 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 the, the other folks are trying to figure out what's wrong. Why don't? Why isn't my responsive partner interested in me? Right? Absolutely, and this is why it causes so much distress. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because yeah. that's what it feels like that they're yeah. not attracted sure. to them, and that's yeah. not the issue. Yeah, and um, so we have so he's more responsive. He's you know less every responsive. Uh, less responsive. You're more responsive. Are we getting it wrong? He, um, what's the, the other one's one? walking down the street thinking about sex frequently? Those are the spontaneous people. I'm okay, spontaneous. so he's 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 more spontaneous, and <laughs> okay. I think I'm more. Responsive. In case you're taking notes, I'm yeah. spontaneous. So <laughs> yes, the yes, uh, yes. the other thing that I think is important, and you're talking about, is for me, conditions have to be right. Yes, yes, and that's and central so he could, to responsive people. Yes. So he could be spontaneous, could be like he saw, you know, something on the TV and he's like ready to go. And I'm like, well, absolutely. I'm more like, well, the dishes need to be washed and exactly. we need to get the you know kids to bed or we need to do X, Y and Z. So I am much more conditional than he is in yes. terms of. Yeah. Yes. And that's so common. But what ha you can just see what happens is David's going to feel she you're not attracted to me. Or yeah. what's wrong with you? And then Julie, you can feel like, yeah, what's wrong with me? Right. Because because society doesn't talk about us responsive people. Right. It talks about the spontaneous people. Yes. And so you just feel that something's wrong with you. And this is just what's such such a sad thing as so many people suffer. Yeah. So as a sex therapist, it sounds like you're doing a lot of education. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. That's a huge piece of it. Yeah, well, that's great. Deb, we would love to have you back to talk more about this topic because this comes sure. up regularly in our work with folks and in our, dis our own yes. discussions. We could do Be a whole to. episode just on this. Absolutely. This has been terrific. Uh, yeah. where, where do folks find you if they want to try to schedule an appointment or get some information about you and your practice? Uh, I'm at www.debfox.com. Excellent. Awesome. That's well, thank you again so much for coming. Uh, this is Conversations for Couples, the podcast. Folks, you can find us at www.thebullitts.com and on all social media platforms at The Bullets. Thank you again, Deb. This has been wonderful. We're going to have wonderful. you back soon. Thank have a great you day, so everybody. Julie Bullitt is a professionally licensed clinical social worker and family therapist. David Bullitt is a divorce and family lawyer. Julie is not your therapist and David is not your lawyer. This podcast is meant for educational and entertainment purposes only.